All right, so um, we are on Margaret Thatcher. Do you have a microphone? At, do, do I need a microphone? Okay, I'll, I'll try my best to project my voice here. Um, so, uh, as always, I needed to say something about uh, Catherine the Great, what we did last week. Um, and um, so, we know that she had many, many affairs, and it was, it was generally speaking, quite open. Um, uh, the longest of which was uh, Orloff, uh, she was with for 11 years, and um, the, uh, her statement after Orloff, because at, at this point in her life, she was just coming to the realization that she was not going to most likely have somebody just for her for the rest of her life. And so this was the quote um, when, once she broke it off with Orloff. After 11 years of suffering, I intend to live according to my pleasure and in entire independence. And then, of course, the, uh, some of the men that she had had their own viewpoints. Um, uh, some of them were not very um, happy about the, uh, the arrangements that they had with Catherine. Uh, one guy that she, she was with for about a couple of years, which and that was fairly typical, uh, of her at this point. Um, when talking with some of his friends, uh, he would just say, I'm just a little whore. That's how he felt with Catherine. So, so on to Margaret Thatcher. So this is gonna be very different because now we have somebody that I think everybody knows and everybody has lived through uh, the experience of uh, Margaret Thatcher. Um, so this will be somewhat different. So we have our bibliography. Um, this first one, um, I, I probably wouldn't recommend unless uh, you want just a very short, very short book with just some information. Uh, you could probably get as much off of uh, uh, an encyclopedia, wiki, uh, or whatever that, uh, Wikipedia. Wikipedia, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Anyway, um, it's 82 pages. It's, it's okay, uh, not very exciting reading, but it's just basic information. Uh, this next one, uh, David Canadine, uh, Margaret Thatcher, a little bit longer, 162 pages. Uh, this was originally an article for the Oxford, uh, uh, bio, bio, biographies um, that they compiled and um, and since it was such a long article they decided to make it into a book and um, so it's it's pretty good reading he's um, he writes as someone who is maybe a reluctant fan if a fan at all he's he gets some real jibes in there that um, I, I I kind of felt was uh, gratuitous. Um, so he has some bad feelings, I think, of uh, uh, Thatcher. But, um, but all in all, he, he tries to be pretty well balanced. Um, this next one, John Campbell. I was fortunate enough to get this book. Uh, it's a, uh, an abridgment of his two-volume uh, work of Thatcher. So this one's only 563 pages. <laughs> Uh, not a lot of short books on her. Um, this next one, uh, Charles Moore is the official biographer of Margaret Thatcher. Um, and it's kind of an interesting uh, story behind uh, how he was chosen and how he went about and is still, by the way, uh, it's a three volume uh, set and only volumes one and two are out. He is not done with the third or at least it's not being published yet. Anyway, um, so they chose him as the official biographer while she was still alive, and um, it was to be someone who's somewhat right-leaning. Uh, he's a, a journalist who wrote articles about her, uh, 
generally favorable, but tries to be balanced. So they chose this guy, and um, and the uh, the rules to follow for him. He could interview anybody. He got access, of course, to her papers as 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 much as he could. As, uh, that were not top secret, um, but um, he was not to publish anything until after her death. She set the boundaries so that he could be free and the people he interviewed would be free to say what they liked without, be, without uh, hurting her feelings when it came out because she was gone. So he had a great access to her so he had uh, a lot of very good interviews, um, and so it's, it's well worth reading if you're into really long biographies. Uh, this first one, uh, 859 pages, and that's just um, up to the Falklands. And then the, uh, volume two, um, during her prime ministership, another 821 pages. Um, and then, of course, uh, Margaret wrote her own uh, memoirs, her own biography, autobiography, in two volumes, um, 656 pages and 914 pages. So, uh, and I must confess, I have not read all of those works. I've, I, I pick and choose uh, the episodes to get the information. I, if I was to give a, a full account of her uh, life, uh, it would be the whole series here. So, so anyway, um, good reading, by the way. It's just, just very long. Now, how many of you have seen Meryl Streep in uh, The Iron Lady? Very good uh, movie, I, I must say. Um, as you know, I don't generally endorse uh, history movies, biography movies, uh, and when I do, it's, it's mainly because they're a good movie and not good history. Uh, this is actually both, for the most part. Um, I could quibble with a number of things in this movie, but it's really just quibbling. This is a very well done movie and very historical uh, in the events that happened. Um, a couple of things uh, that bothered me a little bit, and again, it's just quibbling. Um, one of them, I kind of got the impression that they were trying to make uh, Margaret Thatcher a little less um, attractive than she was in real life. There were two actresses playing her. There was the young Margaret Thatcher and then Meryl Streep playing uh, the grown-up <coughs> Margaret Thatcher. And I thought, you know, comparing, I was looking at pictures of Margaret Thatcher in her 20s, and again, Margaret Thatcher as an adult, and I thought, you know, I think Margaret Thatcher, the real Margaret Thatcher, looks better than the actors that portrayed her. And that's very unusual. Usually, you know, Hollywood movie wants to make everybody very pretty, uh, but I think they toned it down for, for this in her case. Okay, so Margaret Roberts, uh, she was uh, the daughter of Alfred and Beatrice Roberts. Her father, whenever her father is mentioned, he's always mentioned as a grocer because he had a grocery store. He actually had two grocery stores. Uh, but that's very limiting to him because he was so much more than that. Um, he was a lay preacher in the Methodist Church. Uh, he was a Rotarian, Justice of the Peace. Uh, he was a town councilman. Uh, he was the governor of Grantham's Girls School. He was an alderman, and he was the mayor of Grantham for a year or two. So very uh, civic-minded man. And here's the Roberts family. <coughs> and here's Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, she is pretty. Isn't she? Mm -hmm. And it, for those of you who have seen the movie, the young Margaret Thatcher, I thought, you know what? The real Margaret Thatcher is a lot prettier. Mm -hmm. 
So, born 1925, uh, the household in which she was raised, um, rather strict uh, Victorian, you might say, um, but uh, very hardworking, very thrifty, and very well educated. Her father was a voracious reader, uh, as uh, he expected her to be also. She was a good student growing up. Uh, she played on the hockey team uh, in her school. Uh, she was on the speech and debate team. Uh, she was a chemistry major at Oxford and graduated 1947. She was not considered an outstanding student at Oxford. She was just a good student. And here we have, and uh, her first jobs were in chemistry, uh, working in a, the first one was a plastics uh, factory. She was a chemist. And so, and um, her first couple of times running for uh, parliament uh, were in her 20s. Uh, she didn't make it, but, uh, so worked as a chemist, a plastics company, um, she ran for parliament uh, 1950 and 51, but did not succeed. And then she married Dennis Thatcher, 1951. He's 10 years older than her. Um, and by all accounts, uh, it was a great match uh, for both of them. Um, if you ever see uh, news, real, uh, news features of uh, Margaret, and she thanks her husband for his support, uh, now and again, uh, that was not just a platitude. Um, every biographer will tell you that uh, he was a great support for her. He was a wealthy businessman, and, um, but he retired in uh, 1975 uh, to basically support her, and they were a very good match. Uh, often, he would kind of try to tone her down. Um, he, never, he was never publicly political. He didn't want to make the news ever, uh, but behind the scenes, he was a great support for her. And when she worked long hours into the night, uh, he would often uh, tell her, you know, it's, it's time to come to bed. You have worked way too hard. And so, uh, as I say, the times that you will see her thank him for his support, it's very genuine. And I kind of think, you know, there's uh, somewhat of a parallel uh, between her and Ronald Reagan. The two of them were political soulmates, you might say. And Ronald Reagan had his Nancy uh, as the support of his life as well. So she was admitted to the bar, 1953. And here's the happy couple with their family. She had twins. And then Finally, 1958, she won the, uh, the MP, Member of Parliament, seat from Finchley. And um, one thing, too, in, in the movie, they tried to portray her as, like, the only woman there. She was not the only woman. Uh, there were 12 other conservative women that, in the Tory party at this time. So that was, I think, a little bit of a... Uh, flub for the movie. Um, so when she became a, a member of parliament, uh, unlike most freshman members, she immediately uh, was getting in there and promoting legislation. In her maiden speech, she was, uh, she was asked to uh, help support some legislation, and she got in there and did it right away. Uh, she became the secretary to the Minister of Pensions, uh, and there, there are a number of things that are somewhat different in the British government because of the parliamentary system than in the United States that I, I find somewhat fascinating that we'll talk about in a second. Um, the uh, parliament, the members of parliament are expected to be, are, are chosen by the prime minister to be part of the uh, cabinet. Whereas in the United States, the cabinet members, you just choose whoever. Uh, in Great Britain, you choose your cabinet from parliament. That's where you get them. And, and also, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. So, oh, 
there is what's called a shadow minister. So uh, for those of you who know anything about parliament, it's the majority party who has uh, leadership. The prime minister is the leader of that party. And so if that party is in the majority, then that is the prime minister who is, or their leader is the prime minister. So, so he has his cabinet. The opposing party has what's called a shadow cabinet. So for every cabinet post, the opposing party has uh, a minister chosen to oversee the cabinet members of the uh, leading party, the majority party. So there's the, sh there's the cabinet and there's the shadow cabinet from the opposing party. And she was the shadow minister uh, as years progressed uh, in uh, fuel, transportation, and education. Uh, and I got cut off here. Oh well. So once the uh, conservatives, the Tory party, won a majority in 1970, um, she became the education minister. I think I can fix this maybe. Yeah. So that shouldn't happen. Anyway, um, so she worked as a, uh, education minister uh, to uh, provide, to expand school, uh, the comprehensive schools, uh, always trying to get more money, but uh, as budgets are always very tight, um, in one area she tried to reduce the budget, and that was in the milk program. Of all things, somebody should have told her you don't mess with milk <laughs> for young children. And so uh, at the time, and this is 1971, uh, milk was free. It was provided for the kids uh, for free, and she wanted to eliminate that as a free uh, program. And so uh, there was an outrage in Britain over this, and so uh, they, they labeled her Maggie Thatcher Milk Snatcher. <laughs> and they had to get this picture, isn't that something? With her face sticking out like that. She came very close to giving up on politics because of that, the big out, outrage that someone would take milk from our children. Um, but she uh, kept it up. Um, but the 1970s, as you well remember, uh, a lot of unrest, uh, a lot of uncertainty in the Western world as a whole as to the direction that we are going, um, a lot of loss of faith. Um, Inflation, unemployment, uh, not entirely a good time uh, in Great Britain or in the Western world, I think, generally. Um, but in Great Britain, they were pursuing, actively pursuing, the Labor Party anyway, uh, a socialist program. And that had begun uh, after uh, World War II. They started buying up industries, nationalizing uh, major industries uh, as you know, they have uh, their health care is socialized and has been since, um, I believe, in the mid-50s. Um, but, um, and this always causes a lot of unrest for those um, who are employee, employees of these industries now have a target to strike against. The coal miners were the most militant of the bunch. Uh, all of the coal mines were nationalized. Um, and since uh, throughout the 1970s, Britain suffered from great inflation, there was a lot of strikes trying to get an increase of pay. And the coal miners, as I say, were uh, the most militant about it. And um, at one point, they demanded a 20% pay increase. And they went out on strike, and their strikes were pretty ugly. They were not just peacefully walking around with their picket signs. They used intimidation. They also uh, were allowed, when they called a strike, they could call a general strike and get other industries involved to support them. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, the Tories, the Conservative Party, uh, fought actively against, that that should be against the law. If you're going to pick it, you pick it with your company and not the whole nation and everybody else involved. But anyway, 
Um, and of course, uh, gas prices are skyrocketing too. The Yom Kippur War uh, sent fears throughout uh, the world and, and gas prices uh, raised tremendously. Um, and at this point too, uh, there was the, the term U-turn because uh, the conservatives were being pulled along uh, with the Labor Party in this socialist direction so that even though uh, their original uh, ideas were to be uh, pro-business, uh, pro-market um, market, uh, forces, uh, they were being pulled along with the, lab with the movement as a whole towards uh, a more liberal policy. And so the, uh, in the press, they labeled this the conservative U-turn. So here's a little graph. Here's, you can see the 70s uh, were not a good time for unemployment and inflation, especially in Great Britain. Reached uh, pretty bad proportions. So things were looking bad. The conservatives uh, were losing their way and, uh, and had lost a lot of faith uh, with their constituents. And so Margaret Thatcher uh, was looking to take over as the leader of the Conservative Party. Um, the Conservatives had lost power in 74, um, and so she became the Conservative leader in 75. And she was uh, reading up on all the classics uh, of uh, laissez-faire capitalism, uh, Hayek, and uh, Friedman being the most prominent of the, uh, the uh, libertarians in, in our country, they're still pretty popular authors. And she was also, as a good conservative, uh, very anti-Soviet, and she would speak out against the aggressions of the Soviets, and they are the ones, the media in the Soviet Union labeled her the Iron Lady which of course was just a wonderful title for her, and she loved it. And, and what a great thing for someone who doesn't like you to give you such a great name. And um, so yeah, it was the, uh, the Soviet press that came up with that Iron Lady uh, label. So again. The Sylvia pre or Soviet press? Right? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And this was before she was even prime minister. So 1978 uh, was getting to be, it was known that winter as the winter of discontent. There was many riots going on, uh, strikes, um, and a new term came along, stagflation. So you have high unemployment and high inflation at the same time, which traditional Keynesian uh, economics told you that the two of those don't happen at the same time. You either have high unemployment uh, and low inflation, or you have high inflation and low unemployment. Uh, it was happening at the same time. A lot of people were uh, upset about this. And so the conservatives came up with a pretty good slogan, labor isn't working. <laughs> and this was a big billboard uh, that, they would, that they put out to, uh, to promote this slogan for the conservatives. And you see down here, Britain's better off with the conservatives. And this is what it looked like, Britain on strike. The uh, garbage collectors were out on strike. Um, even uh, ambulance drivers uh, were on strike, which you'd think would be illegal. But uh, yeah, even ambulance drivers. Grave diggers were on strike. Um, and of course, the coal miners always go on strike too. Um, one thing that some, and this is a little side note, just my little pet peeve. Um, in getting photographs for this presentation, um, I found that Great Britain, for some odd reason, doesn't use, didn't use a lot of color photography, even in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, if they were that backwards or what, but um, <laughs> it, throughout the 70s, you try to look at photographs from Great Britain <laughs> most of them are in black and white. So anyway, um, 
because of this great discontent, uh, everybody's really upset with the, uh, the Labor Party because they're not fixing things. So the Conservatives won. And since the Conservatives won, uh, Margaret Thatcher is now the Prime Minister. So, 1979, um, she comes in and she has her particular goals. The Conservative Party is promoting these uh, main ideas here. They're going to rein in the militant labor unions. They're going to lower taxes. Uh, they want to privatize uh, government-owned businesses because there's way too many of them that are owned by the government that are losing money. Um, and they're going to sell off government housing. There's approximately five million uh, houses that are government owned and rented by individuals. And her plan was to allow those individuals the option of buying the houses. And of course, she had a strong stand against communism. So in her first budget, they were going to lower taxes, the standard rate from 33 to 30%, and the top rate was going to be lowered uh, from 83% down to 60%. Uh, they were also going to lift the controls from the pound. Uh, it had been controlled by the government, but now they're going to put it out on the market. It's going to be exchanged uh, by according to the market forces, which a lot of people were very afraid of, thinking that uh, the pound might just lose its value or go out of control. And as it turns out, um, it, it held up very well. On the bad side, interest rates uh, were still going higher, up to 17% from 14%. Um, and those of you who uh, were buying houses at this time, uh, remember in the United States, that interest rates had skyrocketed uh, right around 79, 80, 81, uh, right about this level as well. And then there's the value added tax, uh, which is um, a tax on purchased goods uh, that's, that's used against, or it's, it's billed to the companies that are selling goods. It's not like a sales tax in the way that we use sales tax, but it's very close to it. Um, so that was increased from 8% to 15%, which was a huge jump that uh, people weren't expecting. Um, but all in all, uh, she got through much of what she wanted. She was also promoting the uh, uh, selling off of the houses and industry, but not so much at first. Um, and so because of all of these uh, painful measures that she enacted, the conservatives uh, were promoting, um, she was not very popular. She had come in saying that she's going to fix things. And generally speaking, people, when they hear you're going to fix things, they say, okay, it's going to be fixed right now, right? And things are going to get better right away. And of course, it just doesn't work that way. And as you know, uh, Ronald Reagan came in kind of doing the same thing and lowering taxes. And um, in the United States, Ronald Reagan for the first couple of years was not very popular either. And Margaret Thatcher uh, was probably uh, one of the most unpopular prime ministers in her first couple of years uh, as prime minister. So, but oddly enough, there was a uh, an event that probably saved her uh, tenure as Prime Minister, and that was the Falklands <coughs> War. When Argentina uh, invaded the Falklands, um, the, uh, the ministers, the defense ministers, uh, were not really sure that they could get it back. So they had so depleted their military. Anyway, um, Great Britain had acquired the Falklands back in 1833. They did it by expelling a very few people who were there from Argentina. Argentina had um, claimed it 
it had actually been gone, it had gone through a number of different hands, uh, but Argentina had claimed it. There were a very few settlers on there. Great Britain came in and decided that they were going to use it as kind of a, a refueling station. So uh, they took it over in 1833. Um, by 1980, uh, 81, 82, uh, there was a population of about 1,800 uh, Britons who were there living, and they were very loyal to Britain. Talks had been going on for some time because Great Britain, throughout the 70s, uh, there's such a great backlash against imperialism that uh, Argentina was, was again promoting uh, the idea that they should get uh, the Falklands. And the British leadership uh, was considering it, uh, maybe leasing it to them or having a joint uh, ownership of some sort, uh, but they were considering it. By the time Margaret Thatcher came into power, that was pretty much done away with. They were not going to give it up. And, and one of the reasons being is the 1,800 uh, people who lived there uh, did not uh, want Argentina taking over. They were very uh, adamant about that. So here's the Falklands uh, off the coast of Argentina. So Argentina, led by a, uh, a rather both inept and brutal uh, military junta who had been uh, pretty much abusing the government uh, since they came to power, uh, very unpopular, rather brutal. Uh, so they figured one way to become popular is to uh, win a war. And they thought that this would be uh, something that uh, uh, right for the picking. So Leopoldo Galtieri, um, wh who was the leader, it was a, a triumvir. There were three of them, but I believe this guy was the kind of the leader, um, decided that uh, he, they could take the Falklands and Britain uh, would probably just try to negotiate that they were not in a position to take it back. So April 2nd, 1982, uh, with 10,000 troops. Uh, they also took South Georgia Island, uh, which was several hundred miles uh, to the east, um, uh, without, of course, without much warning, they just invaded and uh, took Great Britain by surprise. So when this happened, um, Great Britain, Thatcher's meeting with her ministers and there was a lot of vacillation. Um, they really weren't sure if it could be done. Uh, they had depleted their military substantially through the 70s, not thinking that there would be much of a threat uh, in the future. And so uh, Thatcher, though, was adamant that we are going to take them back. Uh, so whatever it takes, we're going to send the ships, we're going to send the men, we will take it back. Um, uh, there was some difficulty, though, in the United States. Ronald Reagan uh, was friends with this military junta because they were anti-communist. And Reagan uh, was promoting uh, just about anybody who would stand up against communism in South America especially. And um, so he was in an awkward situation. He didn't want to come out against them uh, but he certainly couldn't stand uh, uh, against Great Britain. So he, he contacted Gallieri and let him know that uh, it was not all right, that we are not going to support you. Um, he didn't tell them that he would uh, help out Great Britain, but he said, we are certainly not going to support you. Now, Margaret Thatcher was hoping in her conversations with Reagan that uh, we would uh, have sanctions against Argentina uh, so that there'd be trade sanctions, we wouldn't trade with them at all, uh, and he wouldn't go that far. However, uh, I think Reagan knew that he had to do something, so we did help uh, in, some, in some ways. We supplied, uh, yeah, 
So we supplied intelligence, uh, we sent some uh, sidewinder mis missiles, and we had an island that was fairly close by that they could use as a refueling uh, port. Uh, we sent Alexander Haig to uh, talk with uh, Thatcher. Uh, he was there uh, thinking that uh, he's going to be the negotiator. And he was talking with Thatcher saying, look, how about if we make some sort of deal with them uh, to, so that they could save face and uh, they could have maybe part ownership or something along those lines. And uh, Thatcher said, no, there's going to be no deal. They are going to leave. And um, if you want to talk with them, feel free, but uh, we're not making any deals. As it turns out, they weren't, uh, that Galtieri wasn't going to make any deals either. He was thinking that uh, he was, had the upper hand and he could win. So, so the attack is on. It took something like six weeks to get the ships over there to, uh, to attack, uh, which was you know, a pretty awful uh, time delay so that uh, the Argentines could uh, pretty well entrench themselves in the islands uh, and, and prepare for the onslaught. Um, the first island was uh, uh, New South, or was South Georgia, uh, and that was taken fairly quickly. They had not uh, entrenched too deeply into that island, and they, they didn't have a lot of soldiers there. Um, so uh, the British did land uh, May 21st on Port San Carlos. Uh, Port Stanley was where the majority of the soldiers were uh, from Argentina. Um, and they had pretty much concentrated there to withstand whatever attacks were coming. Um, one, uh, both sides were at somewhat of a disadvantage. Uh, Great Britain had the advantage of ships. They had, there were two aircraft carriers that came down and several support ships uh, there. Uh, and so they could uh, attack with those, and they had some submarines as well. Uh, Argentina had some ships out, uh, but as soon as the first one was sunk, they decided that they couldn't stand up to the ships and aircraft and missiles that the British could throw at them, so they kept their ships in port pretty much from then on. Um, so Great Britain had definitely had an advantage of ships. Uh, they never quite got uh, air superiority, however. Uh, the Argentines had some fairly skillful pilots um, and, and some uh, up-to-date weaponry and missiles uh, so that it was fairly evenly matched. One disadvantage that uh, the Argentines had, though, with their aircraft was that um, the, the range that they had was about as far as the Falkland Islands, so that they could fly from Argentina 300 miles, uh, do their bombing runs or raids or whatever, and then they'd have to fly back immediately uh, because they didn't have enough fuel to stay out there. So anyway, um, so after some pretty heavy fighting, uh, Port Stanley, uh, they surrounded it. The, the Argentines realized they had to surrender June 14th. And, uh, and this is the map I have on your handout, by the way. Shows you the, uh, the battles that were fought. And here's a look at the soldiers. The, uh, the Falkland Islands, as you can see in the background, they look very barren, just kind of uh, hilly and, and grassy. And I, I, I imagine it's, it's pretty cold and windy there a lot of the time. So the cost of the war, the Argentines lost 650 soldiers. And these are not casualties, these are deaths. Um, they lost 30% of their aircraft uh, and a naval cruiser. The British lost 255 men, um, two frigates, a destroyer, a container ship with helicopters, and a landing ship. Uh, the two aircraft carriers were undamaged. And once it was won, the soldiers come home, 
and everybody is wild with joy, and the conservative party is now very popular. And so the next election, Thatcher wins her second term, uh, 1983. And things are starting to look up. Inflation has dropped dramatically. Uh, unemployment is still high, but uh, people are starting to see the benefits of the policies. Um, the Labor Party uh, was still promoting what they always promoted, uh, very strong unions. Um, they wanted to nationalize more industries uh, and massive spending on social programs. And at the time, um, that was not a popular thing in Great Britain. Uh, someone once said that this, uh, this outline of theirs for their, uh, their policies was the longest suicide note in history because it pretty much spelled uh, the doom for them in that election. So in her second term, she's promoting uh, even more her free market uh, reforms. So here's some of the businesses that were privatized, that had been nationalized. British Telecom, British Airways, Brit Oil, British Gas, and Rolls-Royce uh, had been nationalized back in 71, I think. Um, and that brought in uh, a good amount of money, $24 billion, uh, instead of owning companies that were losing money sometimes, they now brought in uh, billions of dollars by selling them. And plus, now that these businesses are on their own, they pay taxes to the government. Um, and in her first uh, few years, they sold off about a million of the five million houses to the renters who had been living there. And wages are starting to rise now. Unemployment, um, I think, peaked in 86. Uh, in Great Britain and then s slowly started to decline. There were the coal miners, however, who were as militant as ever, um, led by a man named Arthur Scargill. Um, the, the coal mines are still nationalized and they control which mines are being run and which ones need to close. Uh, there were something like 163 mines altogether, and they were going to close 20 of them because they were losing money. They were unproductive, inefficient. And so uh, Scargill calls a, a national strike, um, and as usual, uh, there is violence. Uh, some people were killed even. I believe some, there was a taxi driver uh, somebody dropped from an overpass, like some cement thing or other, and killed a taxi driver of all people. Um, but uh, intimidation, violence, and threats to the government, this Scargill character in particular uh, uh, did not uh, curb his mouth at all, it seems like, and would uh, call for the overthrow of the government even at times. And, um, and so he... Uh, to the rest of the nation, he made himself rather unpopular. And the, uh, the coal miners who used to enjoy uh, a certain amount of popularity throughout the population uh, did not so much this time. And again, here's your nice black and white photo. I was looking forever trying to find a good color photo. Coal miners strike. The strike lasted for a year, and, um, but fortunately for Margaret Thatcher, she planned ahead of time. She knew this was going to happen. She planned it to happen. Mm -hmm. She knew that what she wanted to do was to start shutting down some of these uh, unproductive mines mm -hmm. and that when they went out on strike, they had to, had to be prepared. So uh, they stored up the coal. The government had uh, huge uh, reserves so that uh, Britain could go through the winter and not suffer with a lack of coal. The uh, miners, however, did suffer because they were unemployed out on strike. And so after a year of their strike, uh, they finally gave in. And then there is the IRA. 
the Irish Republican Army, uh, uh, an ongoing problem for many years. For uh, I mean, the entire history of Great Britain and Ireland is a very sad tale. Uh, but now you have Northern Ireland, part of Great Britain, and the rest of Ireland as an independent country. And there are the radicals who are saying that uh, Ireland should be for the Irish. Um, uh, you may remember Paul McCartney had a hit song, Give Ireland Back to the Irish. How many of you remember that song? You should look it up. It's a really good song. Um, anyway, so uh, as these, uh, these Irish, uh, the IRA <coughs> members would commit crimes, murder, steal, blow up people, uh, and they were caught and put in jail, put in prison, um, they expected, the leadership expected them to be treated uh, better than anybody else. They were considered by the IRA to be political prisoners. And for Margaret Thatcher, that's ridiculous. These are murderers. These are people who have injured others. They have blown things up. They are not political prisoners. <coughs> However, they did, they had established a, uh, a separate prison for these uh, men, and, and they were treated uh, with a lot more respect than uh, the general prison population just because so much attention was paid to them worldwide. So um, at one point, they had the bright idea of going on a hunger strike, uh, and so uh, they started dying of this hunger strike. Uh, I believe the, the, the leader guy was uh, Bobby Sands, if that name sounds familiar, if you remember this happening uh, back in the 80s. Um, a number of these guys, and uh, Margaret Thatcher, to her credit or not, however you may think of it, uh, was not going to give in to any of their demands. And so they started dying. Um, I think some of these guys uh, you might find in the Guinness Book of Records uh, as living the longest without food. I think that's a, a category that you can find. And something like 60 days or 62 days that uh, some of these guys lasted uh, before they finally died. And of course, um, the ongoing terrorism was one thing, people dying uh, regularly uh, in Northern Ireland and other places, assassinations uh, taking place. and. Um, and then there was the bombing in 1984. I got a color photo of this one. It's probably somebody who, somebody who is not uh, British who took this. But anyway, this was a conservative conference going on in Brighton, and they knew Margaret Thatcher was going to be there. And she narrowly missed uh, death because she was staying up late in some other room studying or working on something. And uh, when the bomb went off, she wasn't where she was supposed to be. So it did kill five people. Um, I, I think a couple of them were the wives of some of the ministers and um, other government workers were there and many other people were injured, of course. Uh, but uh, the Irish Republican Army proudly uh, claimed credit for this. That was 1984. Uh, there had been a lot of pressure being put on uh, Margaret uh, from all around the world to try to settle this dispute. Um, and even in the United States, you have Ronald Reagan, who is Irish, of Irish descent. You have Tip O'Neill, who is very Irish, and several other members of Congress who were putting pressure on Margaret to maybe not have such a strong stand against the Irish condition and uh, try to work with these people. And so uh, by 1985, uh, there was an Anglo-Irish agreement uh, in which they established a uh, really just a kind of a panel, a, uh, a conference they called it, uh, of government officials from Ireland and Great Britain to discuss the issues and to, to discuss Northern Ireland and what was going on there. Uh, it was the type of agreement that pleased nobody. 
But it was a first step. It did not reduce violence. Uh, violence continued. And uh, historians now can look back on that and say, well, this was the first step. It was not anything that uh, settled uh, any problems at the time, but it was uh, in the right direction. This uh, panel, this agency, had no powers other than advisory so that they could talk to the, uh, the government in Northern Ireland and discuss things and let them know what they thought. Uh, so it was a step. So we come to Thatcher and Reagan, uh, the great uh, political uh, pair, political soulmates they were often seen as um, throughout the 1980s. Uh, each of them inspired the other um, towards uh, they had uh, many of the same philosophies of free market and anti-communism uh, so that when they were together, uh, they could commiserate as to their struggles and inspire uh, each other uh, to, uh, to keep going. Uh, there were a couple of minor issues. As I said, at the Falklands, uh, Thatcher really wanted Reagan uh, to be stronger in her favor, uh, and openly so. Uh, Reagan would not because of his fears of uh, communist influence coming into Argentina. Um, also, there is the problem of Grenada, because we invaded Grenada, that tiny little island. Um, Grenada was part of the British uh, Empire, the British, um, uh, not really a British island, but uh, it was part of the trade uh, group of Great Britain. And so when we invaded, uh, we did not tell Great Britain about it. Thatcher didn't know. And so she was kind of upset about that. Um, so that was a, another difference of opinion. And there they are, Thatcher and Reagan. And we have Thatcher and Gorbachev. Uh, Thatcher, uh, at everybody in the Soviet Union knew, was uh, very anti-communist. Um, she invited uh, Gorbachev uh, even before he was the leader of the USSR, uh, to come over to Great Britain to visit because he was an up-and-coming star in the party, and uh, she kind of figured that he would uh, reach uh, higher levels of some sort. So he was invited to London, and they had a nice discussion. Um, one, of, uh, one of the things that she noted uh, was that Gorbachev and the Soviets uh, had a great fear of the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, which we all know is Star Wars program that Reagan was promoting in the 80s. Um, it's interesting that in the West, uh, many people in the United States, in Great Britain, and in Europe thought that this initiative, uh, the Star Wars program, was all but worthless, that it would never do what it's supposed to do, it cannot shoot missiles out of the sky. And yet, uh, the Soviets were actually absolutely terrified of it. They thought that uh, the Americans could do it. And so this was a, a big sticking point uh, throughout the 80s. Anyway, so uh, Thatcher got to visit Moscow in 1987 uh, and was interviewed on Soviet television, one of the rare moments when the people of the Soviet Union could actually uh, hear uh, unedited an interview with a leader from the West. And she said, in her memoir, she said that uh, she found out later that there was, uh, uh, it, there was a big movement in the Soviet Union uh, because of her. This interview uh, in which she stated a lot of things that uh, they just were completely unaware of in the Soviet Union, the massive amounts of missiles that the Soviets had, uh, the troops that were that looked like uh, in, you know, in East Germany uh, that could uh, overrun uh, the rest of uh, Western Europe, um, that were a big fear in the West. And they just did not know that in the uh, Soviet Union. So there's this uh, quote that uh, people, many people have kind of thrown back at her 
uh, that she had early on when she met him, uh, she said that this was a man with whom I could do business. Gorbachev seemed he was different. Um, when she first met him, she, said, she thought that it wasn't so much that he believed differently, but he behaved differently. He was not this monolith, um, cold uh, puppet that just spouted uh, platitudes and uh, Soviet doctrine. He still mouthed the same words, pretty much. But here is a man who looked like he had an imagination. He looked like he had a personality. He looked different. He acted different. And so that was why she believed that he would be different. And as, as we knew, as we know, uh, he was the one who started uh, opening up uh, the Soviet Union with uh, glasnost, the openness. And there they are, Thatcher and Gorbachev. And we come to Thatcher in South Africa. As you remember, in the 1980s, there growing pressure on South Africa because of the apartheid government separating and keeping uh, blacks from voting in the elections, the separation between whites and blacks. And so there is a growing movement throughout Europe and the rest of the world uh, to put trade sanctions on them. Uh, Thatcher was against that. She believed that certainly apartheid should go, but we should work with them and trade more with them to create more prosperity to make that transition uh, easier. Uh, of course, she was pretty much shouted down. Uh, the movement was too strong uh, in the West and in Great Britain. And so she came off uh, to some people like she was defending apartheid, which she certainly wasn't. But um, she's still very popular, or she's, she's, I shouldn't say very popular. She was never really popular, but the Conservative Party was fairly popular. Things were improving in the late 80s. And so the Conservative Party won a landslide in 87, and she continued as Prime Minister and continued her policies of uh, selling off uh, government industries, uh, even public utilities, uh, water authorities, uh, electrical distribution companies, and, um, and another uh, several hundred thousand uh, of government housing uh, was being sold to the people. That was one of her most uh, uh, popular programs. People really liked the idea of going from being a renter to an, a homeowner. And then we come to Thatcher's downfall. In uh, 1989, the Conservative Party promoted what was called a poll tax. And this was a tax on every adult. And in theory, it was the same for everybody. It was not, if you are rich, you pay more. If you're poor, you pay less. It was the same for everybody. And everybody was supposed to pay once a year. Uh, in the United States, we would consider uh, a, the, uh, the property tax as some, somewhat like that, the same purpose. It was for local uh, infrastructure, local, uh, local governments to use uh, in lieu of uh, property tax. And so it, it, was, it was a very unpopular tax and always has been. That type of tax has recurred throughout uh, European history as one of the most unpopular taxes because it is the same amount, not the same percentage. It is the same amount whether you are rich or poor. Now, in this instance, if you were poor, you could apply uh, for a reduction in the amount. Yes? Approximately how much was that amount? So it, it varied from each uh, area, each town had their own rate. And this was another uh, problem for Thatcher because um, once that was enacted, the, uh, the local authorities, town councils and whatnot, started raising the rates. They had control of it. 
Um, so it began as something that was something like, I believe it was 200 pounds for the year, which is a good amount of money, um, if you were poor anyway. Uh, and then it started rising to over 300 pounds per year. So uh, it, it wasn't like, you know, if you were a solid middle class, it was kind of a pain in the neck. Uh, if you were poor, it was it was a real problem. And it, it became so unpopular that in many regions of Great Britain, they absolutely refused to pay. And there were riots over this too. It was estimated as, as much as 30% of the population uh, were not paying. And here we have a nice color photograph <laughs> of the uh, poll tax riots. So it was this and uh, a few other things that um, inspired some of the uh, conservative leadership to challenge Thatcher. Um, at this point, uh, she's, she was uh, prime minister for 11 years, won three elections, and um, she started grating on people, and, and not just the opposition. Conservatives, uh, members of her cabinet, uh, were getting very fed up with her because she seemed to be getting more and more imperious and demanding and uh, somewhat rude. If uh, For those of you who have seen the movie, there's this great clip, a uh, great scene where she's in a cabinet meeting and she's berating this guy sitting next to her about not being prepared. Do you remember that scene? Nobody? Oh, it's, it's really good. And it's like she's picking on this guy. Um, is he, does he have his reports prepared, well prepared? And she starts looking at it and she says, oh, you didn't even spell this right. And so she's picking apart this report that this guy sitting next to her had done. And well, since he is not prepared for our meeting, uh, we'll just adjourn and, uh, and we'll have them carry on at another time uh, when, when he is prepared for our meetings. And um, so I don't know if that was an actual uh, event that uh, happened, but um, the, the, uh, the reports, the, uh, what the cabinet members who were interviewed later will tell you is that um, she became a rather unpleasant person sometimes in these cabinet meetings. So anyway, um, Michael Heseltine uh, was going to challenge Thatcher uh, for the leadership. And here's another really bizarre sort of thing, at least from an American standpoint, that um, the prime minister is the leader of the party. It is not an elected uh, post. You don't vote in Great Britain for the prime minister. You vote for the party. If you elect more uh, conservatives than uh, liberals or le the Labour Party, the person who is the leader of the party is the prime minister. So it's not like you vote for, in the United States, you vote for the president. It doesn't matter um, about the party. Completely separate. And so when the members of the political party decide that they don't want that particular person as their leader anymore, that person is no longer the prime minister has nothing to do with the population voting on anything. It's the political party. And so they had this vote. Michael Hes Heseltine um, wanted the leadership role. He lost, but um, Margaret Thatcher did not get at enough of a majority to uh, eliminate a runoff. And so she was four votes shy of the 208 that she needed. So she just thought at this time, okay, we'll have another vote, and surely uh, I'll win this time with the uh, right number of votes. And at this point, her cabinet comes to her and says, um, you're not going to win. We know this because many, many people in our party have lost faith in you. More importantly, <coughs> the next election that's coming up we think we will lose if we have you as the prime minister. We want someone else as prime minister so that in the next election, we can win. And um, she took that to heart and 
said, okay, fine, I will step down. And it, that's at the point that uh, they choose John Major as the next uh, prime minister. This is one of the last uh, events, last time that she has questions in parliament. And if you have never seen this happen, where the prime minister uh, once or twice every single week has to face parliament and answer questions. If you've never seen this, it's absolutely marvelous uh, how talented these prime ministers are. I've seen a number of their prime ministers do this, and I thought, wow, I don't know that we would ever have a president who could do that in Congress. They are so talented. I think a few of them might be able to, but not many. Um, but anyway, this is, this is after she has already stepped down or said that she's going to resign as prime minister, but it's just not taken effect yet. Come on, you got to work for me. Yeah, I've got to turn this on. Yeah. There we go. Um, there is no doubt that the prime minister has, in many ways, achieved substantial success. There is, there is one statistic that I understand is not, however, challenging, and that is that over her 11 years, the gap between the richest 10% and the poorest 10% in this country has widened substantially. How can she say at the end of her chapter of British politics that she can justify many people in a constituency such as mine being relatively much poorer much less well housed and much less well provided than it was in 1979. Watch this. this is Surely she accepts that is not a record that she or any prime minister can be proud of. This has been that all levels of income are better off than they were in 1979. But what the honourable member is saying is that he will rather the poor were poorer provided the rich were less rich. That way you will never create the wealth for better social services as we have. And what a policy. Yes, you would rather have the poor poorer, provided the rich for That is a liberal policy. Yes, it came out. He didn't intend it to, but he did. Wait to the, I did wait to the honourable gentleman. Uh, thank you. The, the, the Prime Minister is aware that uh, I detest every single one of her domestic policies and I've never had that. And I think that the Honourable Gentleman knows that I have the same contempt for his socialist policies as the people of East Europe who experience it. Oh. I think I must have hit the right nail on the head when I pointed out that the logic of those policies are they'd rather have the poor poor. Once they start to talk about the gap, they'd rather the gap was that. <laughs> Down here. That. Not that. But that. So long as the gap is smaller, the longer the gap is smaller, they'd rather have the poor poorer. You do not create wealth and opportunity that way. You do not create a property-earning democracy that way. Uh, what's great with the Prime Minister? Would you tell us whether she intends to continue her own personal fight against a single currency and an independent central bank when she leaves office? No, she is going to be the governor. On the present structure. <laughs> Which takes all from this 
political power away from us. As my right honorable friend said in his first speech, after the proposal of a single currency, a single currency is about the politics of Europe, it is about a federal Europe by the back door. So I consider that a very nice proposal. Now, where were we? I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. So, we're coming to retirement. She writes her memoirs, uh, 93 and 95. She got uh, 3.5 million for them. Um, she donated her archive of government records to Churchill College and not Oxford. Uh, Oxford being her alma mater, who refused to give her an honorary doctorate, which they had done for every other prime minister prior to her, and so she decided that uh, she was not going to leave them her archives. But she did receive many other honors. Uh, she became the Chancellor of the University of Buckingham and Chancellor of William and Mary, even though it's in the United States. Uh, she was created a life peer, Lady of the Garter, and Presidential Medal of Freedom by George Bush. And then uh, she started having strokes, 94, a minor stroke. Uh, she passed out, but uh, recovered. Um, at 2002, she stopped giving public speeches uh, because she was no longer uh, very good at speeches. But she did make an exception for Ronald Reagan's funeral. She uh, pre-recorded it, and uh, it was played at his funeral. And uh, in 2012, she moved into the Ritz Hotel and died of a final stroke uh, April 8th, uh, 2013. And here's a couple of statues. Uh, this one in uh, uh, 2012 in Westminster, uh, bronze statue that she unveiled. Uh, this one um, is, is going to be a bronze statue. They want to put it um, in her hometown. Um, but they, uh, there's a lot of protests, a lot of people who don't like her still, and um, they're fearing that wherever they put it, uh, it will, might be a focal point of protests and violence. So they're, I think they're still not sure as to what to do with it. So her legacy. This was a paradigm shift, both in Great Britain and in the United States, as those of you who remember Ronald Reagan. People started thinking differently. It wasn't just how much more should the government do for the people. It was uh, questioning whether the government should do anything at all, or at least uh, the socialist policies, especially in Great Britain, um, should the government be buying up industries? Should the government be uh, giving all of these very expensive uh, social welfare programs uh, away? So this was a complete paradigm shift uh, in Great Britain especially, uh, allowing the free market to, uh, to run its course in certain instances, uh, and people found that uh, prosperity uh, can be promoted using that. Uh, home ownership uh, became very popular. Uh, entrepreneurship was encouraged, and um, this great stand against communism which was somewhat of a shift, too, from the appeasement that was being promoted in the 70s. Any questions? Yes? Two off-the-wall questions. Yes. Would you care to put in a plug for your next class? Yes, I will. <laughs> Always glad to do that. So, um, so in the summertime, in July, um, I have two classes that I'll be leading. One will be on poetry. Um, I, I have a great love for poetry, at least some poetry. And so in this class, um, it will be a reading class, and reading and discussion. And anybody who wants to uh, can, can sign up and read whatever poetry they like. 
Of course, I will start out each time because I have my particular favorites. Um, and I will read and there, you know, whatever discussion happens and then whoever wants to uh, afterwards uh, can sign up and, and read theirs. Uh, and then the other class will be uh, fascinating characters that you should know. And this is on characters that are not as well known um, as you know, the great ones that I've done in the past. Um, so I'll have uh, Samuel Johnson um, and uh, James Boswell, who is his biographer. Um, I see, I'm put on the spot here. I'm trying to remember Sanders. the characters. Pips. Uh, Samuel, is Peeps. it Pips or Peeps? I've heard both. But yeah, Peeps, Peeps who was uh, a great diarist throughout the uh, 1650s, I believe. Um, uh, there is and there was a typo in the catalog. The, in quotes, there should be Dame Shirley. I think my R's sometimes look like S's, and so it came out like Shizley or something like that. Uh, Dame Shirley was a writer who was in the California gold fields. She went uh, out with her husband, who is a doctor, and she spent several months uh, out in the gold mining fields, and she wrote of her experiences. Just a marvelous writer. Uh, another one is Ishii. Does anybody know who Ishii is? Man. Huh? Man. Who? Last, last wild Indian in California. Yes. Uh, the last, you know, I don't like the, the term wild, but I don't tried. know what else to call him. Yep. The last uh, Indian who is not put on a reservation. Yeah, and his last few years was living in a museum. People, how they lived in his... his yeah, his a, an amazing story there, too. He died very young, though. Yeah, tuberculosis. But, uh, yeah, so there's that. And um, uh, oh, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And um, this one name that uh, it escapes me now, it's kind of a complex name, Mary. Um, does everybody remember in the catalog? Uh, she was considered one of the first, if not the first, feminist of the Western world in the late 1700s. Uh, Wollstonecraft, thank you. Um, and um, so that's, that's all I can think of off the top of my head. And I'll, I'll be covering more than one person per class because I only have four classes. So um, I'll have to go through them fairly quickly and be better about my time than I usually am. Uh, anyway, any other questions? Since we're talking British politics, have the Brits been any, any more successful at uh, having control over their national debt than we have? And if so, how have they done it? Um, I, I doubt, I'm not, I'm not really into British politics. I, I couldn't tell you authoritatively on that. Yes? Might you know any more details about the poll tax? It seems a little strange to me that uh, this is the thing that, say, brought her. Down. Yeah that she was so adamant about it, and it's a situation where apparently the, the, well, the, the national or federal government decides whether there shall be a poll tax or right. not, and yet you say it's for local services and the amount is determined by the local government. Yeah. That is that very odd, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, you have to understand, too, Great Britain is a much smaller area than the United States. So when the federal, or you know, when the national government makes policies, um, you know, Great Britain's the size of California, you know, so uh, it, the scale is very different. So I, I think they are more, much more involved in local politics at the national level than we would think is appropriate. Well, they have, they have disagreements with local governments there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, one of the things that people will say about Margaret Thatcher uh, as far as, you know, this, this one thing, and it really wasn't this one thing, but this was like the major thing that brought her down. She was not one to uh, very often say, well, maybe I'm mistaken about this. Uh, she, when she stuck to something, she stuck to it, uh, which made her very successful and brought her down as well. Anything else? All right, thank you very much.